Thank you for the opportunity to give this talk, okay? And the topic today is ARDS. Those are the objectives of my talk. Review the new definition of ARDS. Review risk factors for ARDS. Review the evidence-based therapies for ARDS. And this is the outline of my talk. So, starting off with the definition of ARDS, this is the old definition. This comes from 1994. Uh, and in the old definition, you had acute lung injury. It was an acute process. The PO2 FR2 ratio is equal less than 300. You had bilateral infiltrates on the chest X-ray. And it should not be from heart failure so uh, the wedge pressure should be equal less than 18, or there should not be evidence, <coughs> clinical evidence of heart failure. And then you had ARDS, which, which was pretty much the same as acute lung injury, except that the PO2 FL2 is less than 200, equal less than 200. So this is old definition, this is the new definition, okay? Uh, so basically, timing has to be within one week, the chest X-ray, you gotta have uh, bilateral opacities on the chest X-ray, uh, and the o origin of the edema, the origin of the edema should not be from the heart, so uh, they don't talk about pulmonary artery catheter here because we don't place as many as we used to, uh, but they talk about uh, having some sort of objective assessment, echocardiography, maybe brain arteriotic peptides, uh, and then you have a grading of severity, so mild ARDS is when your PO2 FL2 is between 200 and 300. Moderate is when the PO2 FL2 is between 100 and 200. And severe when this PO2 FL2 is less than, 300, less than 100. And uh, they also add PEEP. So you gotta have a PEEP equal more 5 in this new definition. Uh, but basically ARDS is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That's what ARDS is. Uh, so, they found that this grading has some prognostic uh, significance. So, if you have mild ARDS, your mortality is around 20%. If you have moderate ARDS, your mortality is around 41%. And you have severe ARDS, your mortality is 50%. In the pathogenesis of ARDS, you start off with a villa injury. This can be a pneumonia, it can be an aspiration, uh, can be an acute pancreatitis with release of inflammatory markers. That leads to diffuse alveolar damage. And you have a lot of uh, uh, release from the lung of uh, inflammatory cytokines. And uh, eventually you're going to have neutrophil recruitment. So there's a neutrophilic inflammation in ARDS. And again, in the pathogenesis, you have damage to the capillary endothelial. You have protein escape from the vascular scale in space. You have fluid shifting to the interstitial, uh, edema, loss of func functional surfactant. And all of these things uh, are going to create the three clinical characteristics, are going to cause the three clinical characteristics of ARDS, which is impaired gas exchange, so patients are going to be hypoxemic, decreased lung compliance, and pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is common in patients of ARDS. ARDS has been divided into three stages. Uh, the first stage occurs, it's called exudative stage, and it occurs uh, in the first four to seven days, and it's characterized by edema, high limb membranes, elevated cytokines, and loss of coagulation and fibrinolytic homeostasis. The proliferative stage is between 7 and 21 days, and here you start having some intimal fibrosis and proliferation of type 2 cells and fibroblasts. And then you have the fibrotic stages, uh, more than 21 days in general. You have extensive pulmonary fibrosis, you can have some emphysema as well. You have loss of alveolar architecture. Now, ARDS is a heterogeneous entity in that it is, it is caused by many different conditions. Uh, they, this, these etiologies of ARDS, they have been divided into pulmonary and extrapulmonary. So common, uh, pulmonary etiologies of ARDS include pneumonia, which is the most common cause of ARDS actually, aspiration, pulmonary contusion, 
inhalation, injury, and fat embolize. So those are pulmonary etiologies of ARDS. And then you have extra pulmonary etiologies of ARDS, sepsis, trauma, drug overdose, acute pancreatitis is uh, characteristic uh, etiology of uh, extra pulmonary etiology of ARDS, and cardiopulmonary bypass. So ARDS is heterogeneous in that it is caused by different conditions, and the prognosis will vary according to the etiology of ARDS. It is important to uh, take that into account when talking about prognosis. Now, uh, this classification pulmonary and extrapulmonary ARDS has some physiological implications. Uh, extrapulmonary ARDS tends to cause more ground glass opacities, edema, and tends to be more responsive to PEEP. So this is extrapulmonary ARDS. You can see all these ground glass changes Ground glass means uh, alveolar filling, uh, and then when it gets more dense, it is consolidation, okay? But here you see all these ground glass changes, and this is more characteristic of extra pulmonary etiology of ARDS, which, again, tends to be more responsive to PEEP. And this is a classic uh, CAT scan of a patient of a pulmonary etiology of ARDS. You see more dense consolidations in the bases. Investigators have evaluated risk factors uh, for ARDS and have created uh, some clinical prediction rule to establish the risk of someone developing ARDS, someone who comes to the hospital, what would be the risk that that patient would develop ARDS. So some of the predisposing conditions to ARDS include shock, so someone who comes to the hospital in shock, that patient would be at risk of developing ARDS. Of course, aspiration, sepsis, pneumonia, some high-risk surgeries, including orthopedic spine, acute abdomen, cardiac surgery, aortic vascular surgery, some high-risk traumas, such as a traumatic brain injury, smoke inhalation, near drowning, lung contusion, multiple traumas. There are also some what they call risk modifiers, some characteristics of the patients that set them up for development of ARDS, alcohol abuse, obesity, hypoalbuminemia, chemotherapy, requiring FL2 more than 35, tachypnea, oxygen saturation less than 95, acidosis, and, and diabetes is actually protective. So investigators have created a score that can predict the probability of someone developing ARDS when they come to the hospital. And here you can see the number of points and the probability of ARDS. As the number of points increases, your probability goes up. This is important because now you can kind of, uh, when patients come to the hospital, you can, from a research standpoint, you can try to investigate uh, potential therapies to prevent someone from developing ARDS, and that's what's going on. There are a number of clinical trials going on evaluating uh, therapies to prevent someone from developing ARDS. So, uh, investigators have also uh, found that ARDS often develops after the patient comes to the hospital. So, it's more common for someone to come to the hospital and not have ARDS and then subsequently develop over a couple of hours to days. So, that brings the question. Uh, are there some risk factors that we can actually modify while the patient is in the, in the hospital? In other words, can we prevent ARDS? So investigators have looked at this, and there are some things that uh, really set you up for ARDS. For instance, inadequate empirical antimicrobial, the odds ratio to develop ARDS is going to be 3.6 higher, so aspiration, of course, if someone aspirates, I mean, the huge odds ratio here, 52 but also things that really can make a difference, such as transfusion of blood products. You see here red blood cells increase the risk by 40%. Uh, plasma will also increase your risk by 40% of developing ARDS. Uh, platelets uh, increase your uh, risk by two. And, and, and also tidal volume. So every, these are patients who baseline did not have ARDS, and we're looking at risk factors for development of ARDS. So tidal volume, every 1cc per kilo of a deal body weight increasing your tidal volume 
will increase, it will double your risk of developing ARDS. So, bottom line is avoiding blood products, okay, and ventilating everybody with low tidal volume. And to the extent that is possible, avoiding aspiration, I know that this is something that we do anyway all the time, but to the extent that is possible. And also being careful if your antibiotic choice will have an impact in the development of ARDS. This is just to show that the mortality of ARDS appears to have been decreasing over time. The study is a little bit old and they looked up to, they looked from early 80s to late 90s and they found that the mortality had been decreasing with a little bit increase here, but overall the mortality had been decreasing from close to 70% in the early 80s to uh, a little bit over 40% in the late 90s. And, and I think that it continues to decrease slowly. Uh, and this slide is just to show that ARDS is indeed a heterogeneous condition. This is important when talking to families. Uh, so here, you look at the year of 1998, and you can see that the mortality of ARDS caused by sepsis was close to 60% at that point. On the other hand, the mortality of ARDS caused by trauma was less than 20%. So it's important to have that in mind. This was an interesting review article. Uh, there are some conditions that really mimic ARDS, but they are not quite ARDS, okay? So, what are these conditions? So, one is acute interstitial pneumonia, okay? Uh, when it is idiopathic, we call that grammar reach. It can also be caused by drugs. Another one is acute eosinophilic pneumonia. And the hint for that will be eosinophilia in the peripheral blood and uh, increased eosinophils in the bronchavilla lavage. Uh, another one is organizing pneumonia, formerly called BOOP. And BOOP can be, uh, organizing pneumonia can be primary or secondary. Uh, when secondary, it can be caused by drugs, uh, radiation, infection. Uh, another one would be uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So if you have a vasculitis, or if you got some chemotherapy, you can develop that. Uh, another one is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a type 3 reaction that occurs when you inhale uh, some substance, usually organic matter. Um, so folks who are exposed to birds or smoke, sometimes they'll develop uh, um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It can be acute, subacute, and chronic. When it is acute, it can just look like a pneumonia, and it can look like ARDS as well. Now, some of these conditions, they can be picked up by uh, uh, bronchoscopy. For instance, uh, uh, alveolar hemorrhage, you can pick up that by just doing a bronchoscopy of BAL. Uh, eosinophilic pneumonia, you can also pick up, you send the cell differential of the BAL, you find a lot of eosinophils. Those are not common conditions, so, um, but if it is, you're not really sure of the etiology of ARDS, it's good to think about these conditions as possible etiology for what's going on. Now, uh, I always talk a bad side with you guys about how can a ventilate, uh, how can mechanical ventilation harm a patient? So, the mechanisms of ventilation-induced lung injury. And we always talk about volotrauma, barotrauma, atelectrauma, and oxygen toxicity. So those are the things that we've got to pay attention to when we put someone on a ventilator. And this is even more true when you're dealing with patients with ARDS. This is the uh, volume pressure curve of the respiratory system of someone who has ARDS. As you can see, this is a sigmoid curve. It has a lower inflection point, and an upper deflection point, okay? And what you want is to ventilate the patient between the low inflection point and the upper deflection point. Above the upper deflection point, you're gonna get barotrauma and volotrauma, and below the low infle inflection point, you're gonna have atelectrauma. So you really, uh, what you have to do is, first, you wanna use PEEP to ventilate the patient above the low inflection point, so you, you avoid this opening and closing of the airways that leads to release of a, a lot of inflammatory cytokines. 
And you want to ventilate the patient with low tidal volume, so, so you avoid uh, going above the upper deflection point, you avoid again barotrauma, volotrauma. So then uh, the ventilation strategy in patient with RDS will be low tidal volume, PEEP, and as a consequence of the low tidal volume, patients will often develop permissive hypercapnia. We think that may actually be beneficial to the patient, the permissive hypercapnia. It has some hemodynamic benefits, increases the cardiac output. So uh, I'm just going to present the uh, landmark clinical trial that was done uh, uh, here in the United States uh, and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It compared low tidal volume with uh, high tidal volume. So 6 cc per kilo of ideal body weight versus 12 cc per kilo of ideal body weight. At that point, it was felt that standard of care would be to ventilate someone of uh, 12 cc per kilo of ideal body weight, although some folks questioned that. The first primary outcome was death before a patient was discharged home and was briefing without assistance. Secondary outcome was number of days without uh, ventilator use. So I always like to go over the protocol because I think this protocol is what you all have to replicate at bedside when ventilating your patients with ARDS. This is the protocol for the experimental group, the, the group of low tidal volume. So, uh, tidal volume was based on predicted body weight, and as you know, uh, that takes into account sex and height, okay? The tidal volume was 4 to 6 cc per kilo of ideal body weight, and the plateau pressure was equal less than 30. So, in other words, you'd initiate the patient 6 cc per kilo of ideal body weight, but if your plateau pressure was high, you'd go further down in your tidal volume. The respiratory rate was titrated to maintain a pH between 7.3 and 7.45. So they would be comfortable with someone having a pH of 7.3. Uh, in this protocol, uh, below 7.3 was a problem. Uh, in my practice, I ventilate patients with a pH above 7.25 and I have no problem with that, but this is the protocol here, okay? And they used a combination of FIL2 and P to keep adequate oxygenation. They considered adequate oxygenation, PO2, above 55, or oxygen saturation above 88. And this landmark study uh, showed a decrease in mortality. Uh, was, uh, mortality was 31% in the low tidal volume versus 39.8% in the high tidal volume, that was statistically significant. So this clinical trial really changed practice, or, or at least uh, made the case to really use low tidal volume. So we know that we have to use PEEP in patients with ARDS. Just how much PEEP is a matter of controversy as well, as you know, in the ASNET, they use the PEEP FIL2 table. You find two tables in the internet. You have a high PEEP FIL2 table and a low PEEP FIL2 table. So basically, you're going to titrate your PEEP based on how much FIL2 your patient is requiring to keep the oxygen saturation above 88. Okay, that's how you're going to be titrating the PEEP. But as you know, you have two tables. Uh, so what table should I use? How much PEEP should I use? So... Uh, this study was published in JAMA. This was a meta-analysis of individual patient data. Oh. And, and they looked at uh, more than 2,000 patients. And they looked at hospital mortality. And overall, there was no statistically significant difference between the mortality uh, in the group who got high PEEP versus the group that got low PEEP. And when I say a group that got low PEEP, it's not a PEEP of 5. It's still they got... PEEP uh, according to the FIL2, okay? However, if you look at the patients who had moderate or severe ARDS, so if your PO2 FIL2 was less than 200, then using high PEEP led to a mortality benefit. So the mortality was in this group was 34% in the high PEEP group versus 39 in the low PEEP group. And that was statistically significant. So again, uh, if you have a PO2 FL2 that is less than 200, 
you, your hazard of dying is going to be decreased if you use high PIP. On the other hand, if your PO2 FR2 is more than 200, it seems that using high PIP may actually lead to increasing mortality, but this was not statistically significant. So there is what I call an interaction here. So if your PO2 FR2 is less than 200, try to use the high PIP FR2 table. If your PO2 FR2 is more than 200, try to use the low PIP FR2 table. So, I just talked about how you really ventilate a patient for IDS, and that's really the bread and butter that you all have to apply in the ICU for your IDS patients. Now we're going to talk about a little bit more advanced things. So, one thing that has been uh, in the spotlight uh, more recently is the front position. So, as you know, patients of ARDS, they have hypoxemia, and this hypoxemia is secondary to a ventilation perfusion mismatch, and sometimes they even have true shunt. So, what is true shunt? It's when alveolar units are not ventilated, but are perfused. So, uh, how can prone uh, position help with that? Some mechanisms have been proposed one of them is that prone leads to increasing lung volume. Another one is that prone position leads to a redistribution of perfusion. And another one, which is probably the most likely mechanism, is that prone position leads to recruitment of dorsal lung with more homogeneous distribution of ventilation perfusion. So, uh, in prone position, densities in the dorsal part of the lung decrease. So the dorsal region tends to re-expand, and the ventral region tends to collapse. How, so, so here you see, this is the dorsal region here. Okay, here the patient is in the supine position. And you see the densities tend to accumulate here in the dorsal region. Okay, so when you pronate someone, those densities kind of migrate to the ventral region. It just so happens that the dorsal recruitment usually prevails over the ventral de recruitment. So perfusion remains greatest in the dorsal lung regions. So you get more homogeneous distribution of alveolar inflation and ventilation. So your VQ improves. And so you have a, a, also a consequent increase in oxygenation. So why, why does that happen? Why the uh, dorsal recruitment prevails of the ventral day recruitment. This is a little bit out of my expertise, but um, from what I could understand is that the, in the supine position, the chest has almost a triangle-shaped form, okay? And with the force of gravity, this triangle-shaped form sets these densities to kind of accumulate in the dorsal region. When you pronate the patient, the force of gravity uh, still is there, but just because of the form of the chest, these densities tend to be more homogeneously distributed. So, there is a rationale for prone position. And we know uh, from prior studies that it leads to improved ox oxygenation, but does prone position will improve outcomes, hard outcomes, such as mortality. Uh, a relatively recent study looking into that, it was a multi-center clinical trial done in Europe. The inclusion criteria, this is important, important to know the inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria was a PO2 FR2 less than 150, a FR2 of at least 60 and a PIP of at least 5. Patients should not be on mechanical ventilation for more than 36 hours. And once they identified these patients, they did not pronate the patients right away. They gave a, 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 a period of 12 to 24 hours to see if the patient would improve on, on his own. If the patient didn't improve, the patient still met this criteria, then the patient would be enrolled. So 237 patients were assigned to prone position, and 229 patients were assigned to supine position. The primary endpoint was mortality at day 28, and this is uh, just uh, the baseline characteristics of the patient. I, I think it's always nice to look at that and, and see how, what are the characteristics of the patients they enrolled. Uh, so they all got 60 CP per kilo for deal body weight, 
Their PIP was surprisingly low to me. It was 10. Uh, I, the baseline FL2 was on average 80%. Uh, and so on. So, and what was so, once you pronated the patient, when would you stop the pronation? Uh, so, you'd stop the pronation when the patient had a PO2 FL2 more than 150, equal more than 150, a PIP equal less than 10, and FL2 equal less than 0.6. And this criteria had to be met for at least four hours in the supine position. And one thing I didn't mention here, but they pronated patients for 16 consecutive hours a day. For at least 16 consecutive hours a day. And uh, what they found was a significant uh, decrease in mortality of the prone position. So the mortality at 20 days, 28 days, was 16% in the prone position versus 32.8 in the supine position. That was very remarkable. And before this study, before this study, there are several, uh, several, but a couple of other studies showing improvement in, 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 in uh, oxygenation, but individually not an improvement in mortality. There was a meta-analysis that had shown an improvement in mortality. But this study actually uh, was able to demonstrate an improvement in mortality of prone position. Uh, the other therapeutic option that I want to talk to you about for ARDS is ECMO. So what is ECMO? ECMO is extracorporeal circuit that directly oxygenates and, and removes carbon dioxide from the blood. Typically, a cannula is placed in a central vein. Blood is withdrawn from the vein to an extracorporeal circuit by a mechanical pump before entering an oxygenator, and oxygenated blood is returned to, 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 uh, to the vessel, to the central vein. So that's called venovenous uh, ECMO. So again, uh, blood is withdrawn, uh, a cannula is placed, and blood is withdrawn uh, by a pump, and, and gets into the oxygenator, and eventually is returned to the circulation. So venovenous uh, ECMO. There are some alternatives to venovenous ECMO. One is venoarterial ECMO, so pump returns blood to the arterial system. Uh, it can provide hemodynamic support if needed. There is extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, so uh, for that you need a smaller cannula. It's less suited to oxygenation. And there is arterial venous carbon dioxide removal, so you don't need a pump for that. But the main one that, you, that is used for ARDS is venovenous ECMO. So uh, the uh, composition of gas is determined by adjustment of a blender that mixes room air of oxygen. So FIO2 is titrated directly from the blender. Uh, elimination of carbon dioxide is determined by the amount of sweep gas, the flow rate of sweep gas. The greater the flow, the more CO2 is eliminated. And the oxygenation is mainly uh, determined by the amount of blood removed from the circulation. So, again, the oxygenation is mainly determined by uh, how much uh, the flow rate here, okay, how much blood is removed. Uh, the CO2 is determined mostly by the sweep gas. And you can also titrate the FR2 here in the blender. So when you when you put someone on ECMO, you still have to ventilate that patient. Uh, you're gonna use pressure volume control ventilation, either one, and you're gonna put a respiratory pressure of 20 to 20 to 25 if you're on pressure control ventilation, or a tidal volume of 4 cc per kilo of ideal body weight if you're on volume control. You're gonna put a low respiratory rate of 10 breaths per minute. You're gonna use a PEEP of 10 to 15. You still wanna use PEEP, and, and typically you're gonna use a FLT of 30%. So, has there been a clinical trial that looked at ECMO in ARDS? Yes, there was one. It was very challenging to carry that trial. It took a lot of years to plan. It was done in UK. Okay, it's called the CISA trial. So it was a multi-center clinical trial. And the inclusion criteria was a patient aged 18 to 65, severe respiratory failure. They used a Murray score of three or more 
or uncompensated hypercapnia pH less than 7.2, and they had some exclusion criteria. So if a patient had high inspiratory pressure or high FL2 for more than seven days, the patient was excluded. If a patient had intracranial bleeding, the patient was excluded. Or if there was contraindication to heparinization, because you have to anticoagulate a patient when you put someone on ECMO. So uh, th this was a pragmatic trial. A pragmatic means that um, the control group got the standard care that the hospitals were providing. So they did not really mandate that the control group get low tidal volume, although they stimulated or they suggested, but they did not mandate. So standard practice was compared with a protocol that included ECMO. So the primary hypothesis of this trial was that ECMO-based protocol would increase survival without severe disability by six months and would be cost-effective. So, I'm sorry, this is very busy, but I just want to show something. So, this trial had a main center where they used the patients to get the, the ECMO, and there are a couple of hospitals that did not have ECMO that would refer patients to this hospital, okay? So, 90 patients were assigned to ECMO and 90 to conventional treatment. 68 ended up getting ECMO. So, 22 patients that were assigned to ECMO ended up not getting ECMO, and that was because uh, 16 improved, actually. Uh, three patients died within 48 hours before transfer, two patients died during transfer, and one had contraindication to heparin. So 16 patients improved before they actually got ECMO. Uh, and again, this is the features of the groups, uh, half of the patients got ECMO within 48 hours of mechanical ventilation, as you can see here. Um, the main uh, etiology for ARDS was pneumonia. And what they found was that 63% of patients allocated to ECMO versus 47% allocated to standard care survived to six months without disability. So ECMO, uh, a patient being randomized to ECMO led to an improvement in survival. This was an intention to treat trial. So because it was an intention to treat trial, and this is the, uh, the most appropriate way of, uh, of analyzing clinical trials, by the way, but because it was an intention to treat trial, those patients who survived, who were assigned to ECMO, and yet did not get ECMO and survived, they are counted as being the ECMO group. They are analyzed as being that ECMO group. So, uh, so this is a criticism of the trial. So a lot of patients that were assigned to ECMO actually improved. Why is that? Maybe because they ended up being referred to a bigger center where maybe uh, they used more low tidal volume, they had more expertise, we don't know for sure. For sure. Uh, another criticism of this study is that they did not really mandate low tidal volume in the control group. So this study obviously has criticisms. It's not definitive, but it clearly says that ECMO is an option if you have a patient who is having difficulty oxygenating. Now here they had two serious adverse events, both in the ECMO group. Uh, there was mechanical failure of oxygen supply in the ambulance, which resulted in death, so that was during transportation, and there was a vessel perforation during cannulation, which contributed to death in one patient. So this is a nice review article. I uh, suggest you all to read that. Uh, it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2011. Uh, it uh, gives you the indications for ECMO, so severe hypoxemia, so a ratio of PO2 FL2 less than 80, despite the application of high levels of PEEP, typically 15 to 20, for at least six hours. Uh, someone who is severely acidotic with a pH less than 7.15, or if you are using, uh, if you are using excess, excessively high, if you are having excessively high uh, plateau pressure, more than 35 to 45, depending on the uh, body weight. 
Uh, also, equally important is to look at the contraindications for, for ECMO. So, someone who's been having a uh, high plateau pressure for more than seven days, there will be a contraindication, a relative contraindication. Someone who's been requiring a uh, high FL2 for more than seven days, more than 80%. Someone has limited vascular access or any condition that carries a, a poor prognosis, no matter what, someone had a bad stroke. And then there is a absolute contraindication when you cannot anticoagulate a patient. That's an absolute contraindication because you do have to anticoagulate these folks when you put them on ECMO. So, uh, the other topic I want to talk about is an individualized approach, approach to PIP. So, you are going to be using the PIP FL2 table to set the PIP, but there are different ways that you can actually set the PIP. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go in details of uh, different techniques that you can use. We, we, we don't do that very often anyway in the ICU, but you can, you can find the PIP uh, looking at the compliance of the patient of different PIPs. Uh, you know, sometimes you increase the PIP and the, the lung compliance improves, so then you can use the PIP where you have the best compliance. There are other ways you can titrate the PIP based on image, based on CAT scan. We don't do that, but there are different ways you can titrate the PIP. Uh, but one of them uh, that I think we're starting to do over at Jewish, and there are some clinical trials I'm going to evaluate if this is something that is worth doing, but I think it's very interesting from a physiological standpoint I'm going to talk about. So... Before I go over that, let's just uh, remember the, the equation of motion. This equation is very important, okay? In order to provide mechanical ventilation to a patient, there's got to be a driving pressure, okay? And this driving pressure has two components. One component is to resist, uh, to overcome the resistance of the airways, and one component is to uh, overcome the recoil of the respiratory system, or to distend the respiratory system. So, uh, the component to overcome the resistance of the area is called that resistive pressure and its flow times resistance. And the component to distend the respir respiratory system we call that elastic pressure and its volume divided by system compliance, also called plateau pressure. If I go on the ventilator and I perform an inspiratory pause, I eliminate flow, so I, el I eliminate the resistive pressure and I'm left with the plateau pressure. And remember that the ARDS uh, causes low compliance, so the plateau pressure is going to be high. So compliance is going to be low, the plateau pressure is going to be high. So when ventilating patients with ARDS, we measure the plateau pressure. We monitor the plateau pressure in order to avoid ventilation-induced lung injury. But the transpulmonary pressure is what really matters when it comes to ventilator-induced lung injury. So what is transpulmonary pressure? The transpulmonary pressure is the pressure to overcome the lung recoil. So how can I get that? So you get the pressure to overcome the respiratory system recoil, that's the plateau pressure, minus the pressure to overcome the chest wall recoil, that's also called pleural pressure or you can get a surrogate, which is the esophageal pressure. So, but we don't typically measure the pleural pressure or the esophageal pressure. We don't do that. So we often, we just get the plateau pressure. So, what is the assumption when, when we don't measure the esophageal pressure? The assumption is that the pressure to overcome the chest wall recoil is of low magnitude and does not vary from patient to patient. That's the assumption. But this is actually not true. Esophageal pressure is going to be elevated in obesity. More commonly, it's going to be elevated in patients who are edematous, who got too much fluid, or who have some uh, intra-abdominal pathology. So, why is that important, anyway? Well, avoiding athletic trauma is another important strategy. In some patients, particularly patients who are edematous, Transpulmonary pressure may actually be negative at the end of expiration. So raising PEEP until transpulmonary pressure becomes positive at the end of expiration could assure that airways remain open. And the plateau pressure may reach 35 or more when the transpulmonary pressure at the end of expiration 
is uh, much lower. So let me give an example. Say you have a patient who is obese and is very dematous, got a lot of fluids, and uh, the PEEP patient has ARDS or mechanical ventilating, that patient has a PEEP of 18 and a plateau pressure of 45. That's scary, right? Uh, anybody would get scary with a plateau pressure of 45. Now, you put a, a esophageal balloon and you measure the, the pleural pressure. And the pleural pressure in the end of expiration is 24. That's quite high. Now, you then you calculate the transpulmonary pressure, which is the plateau pressure minus the pleural pressure of end expiration. And you find that the transpulmonary pressure in expiration is only 21. So anything below 25 is good. So actually, you should not be concerned about bottle trauma here. Then you look at the pleural pressure at end of expiration, and that's 19. Then you look at the transpulmonary pressure of end, expiration, end of expiration, which is PEEP minus the pleural pressure at end of expiration. And you found that the transponer pressure at the end of expiration is actually minus one. So what's going on here? Is the patient uh, having barotrauma? trauma? Not really. The patient is having atelic trauma. So the answer here is, would be go up in the PEEP, not go down in the, in the PEEP. Or... So we don't have esophageal balloon yet at the University of Louisville Hospital, but I'm told that they are using a red at Jewish, just for, so, so that you know. So, but okay, so there is all this physiological rationale, it looks really interesting. Is there any data to support using an esophageal balloon? There is a, a pilot study. Uh, it was uh, uh, six to one patients. It was published in the New England, actually. And the intervention group, the PEEP level set to keep the pr transpulmonary pressure zero to 10 end of expiration. And they would limit the tidal volume to keep the transpulmonary, transpulmonary pressure less than 25. The primary endpoint was arterial oxygenation, and this small pilot study uh, showed improved, improved oxygenation and respiratory system compliance in the esophageal pressure guided group. So, really, there is not strong data to support the use of esophageal balloon, but it makes a lot of sense if someone is morbidly obese and you have a, 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 a plateau pressure that is high. But you don't believe that the transpulmonary pressure is going to be high. Or someone who is very edematous, and again, the plateau pressure is high, you're having difficulty oxygenation, oxygenating the patient. Uh, so you can also, as a surrogate, sometimes get a intrabladder pressure if you don't have an esophageal balloon. So if your intrabladder pressure is high, then the odds are that the pleural pressure is going to be high as well, just so that you know. So uh, this was also a, a small study, but I think very interesting. Uh, this was a, a prospective observational study done in Italy. Uh, they had 14 patients that were referred, they were like an ECMO center, just like Jewish. They had 14 patients with H1N1 associated with ARDS that got referred to them for ECMO. In seven patients, the transpulmonary pressure was actually high. So remember, the transpulmonary pressure at the end of inspiration, more than 25, is concerning. So in seven patients, the average was 27. In other seven patients, the transpulmonary pressure was actually 16. So raising PEEP in the seven patients who transp whose transpulmonary pressure was low, raising PEEP to approach the upper physiological limit of transpulmonary pressure improved the oxygenation index. So basically, he is showing the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure in this group is high uh, and in this group is low. So what they did here in this group, they raised the PEEP to approach the physiological, the, the, the physiological threshold of the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. And with that, they actually avoided seven patients from having to go through ECMO. So the seven patients whose transpulmonary pressure is more than 25 ended up getting ECMO. There are the other seven patients whose transponer pressure was below 25, they just went up in the PEEP, and they avoided these patients from having to undergo ECMO. So, small study, but interesting, if you are in a center that does ECMO, like Jewish, 
uh, it might be worthwhile looking at the transpulmonar pressure before you uh, commit the patient to ECMO. So uh, the other therapeutic uh, strategy for ARDS that I want to talk about is the fluid status. So this study that was published in 2006 was really a, a paradigm changing study. This study really changed practice. We used to give a lot of fluids for patients with ARDS. Now, this study looked at uh, fluid different fluid strategies in ARDS. So what was the inclusion criteria of this study? So PO2 FO2 less than 300, bilateral infiltrates on the chest X-ray, no evidence of left atrial hypertension. The primary endpoint was death before discharge home during the first six days after randomization. So again, they uh, enrolled uh, 1,001 patients, half to the conservative fluid management and half to the liberal fluid management. I'm going to go over what that means. So how did they titrate whether the patient, or how did they decide, and put that way, whether the patient would receive fluids or diuretics? This was a, a study looking at different strategies to manage the fluid status of patients. So how did they establish whether well, I'm going to give some diuretics to the patient or I'm going to give fluid? They actually looked at the CBP. They also looked at the wedge pressure uh, because this was a two-by-two two factorial design. This study was also... Uh, These same patients, they're also looking at whether to use uh, pulmonary artery catheter in this patient. So a number of patients in this study actually had a pulmonary artery catheter. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna be uh, restricting our review here to CVP just because we don't place pulmonary artery catheter as often anymore. So how did, did they decide whether to give fluid or, or diuretics to patients? They looked at the CVP. So in the liberal fluid group, if the CVP was less than four, they would give fluid bolus to the patient, no matter what. If the CVP was four to eight, uh, patients would be on KVO, or they would get uh, some fluid bolus if the urine output was low. If the CVP was 9 to 13, those are patients with ARDS again, and they are not in shock, by the way. If the CVP was 9 to 13, they would get Lasix, or they would get dobutamine if they had ineffective circulation. Uh, and that is based on the cardiac index or capillary refill. If the CVP was 30, more than 13, they would, again, uh, get Lasix or, 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 or Lasix plus dobutamine if in effective circulation. And what about the conservative fluid, uh, the conservative strategy group? If the CVP was less than 4, they would get uh, KVO. They would get a fluid bolus if they had low urine outputs. If the CVP was 4 to 8, they would get Lasix. See how this is different from here, right? So they would get Lasix. They would get a fluid bolus if the urine output was low. And then if the CVP was more than 9, they would get Lasix, and sometimes they would get Dobutamine as well. So what was the bottom line of this study? Basically, the liberal strategy group, after 7 days, was positive 7 liters. 7 liters positive. And the conservative strategy group was negative minus 136. And this was uh, statistically significant. So the mortality was 22.5% in the conservative strategy group versus 28.4. So it's not quite significant, but there is a trend here. Okay, there is a trend here. The p-value is 0 0.3. But the conservative strategy led to improved oxygenation, improved lung injury score, improved, nu improved number of ventilator-free days, uh, improved days not spent in the ICU. So all the outcomes were better. So again, this was a paradigm-shifting study. Uh, it really made us think about fluid status in patients with ARDS. There are a number of observational studies saying that the more positive your fluid balance throughout the hospitalization, the worse your outcomes. Uh, uh, there's a problem with these observational studies, which is uh, uh, confounding. Uh, uh, so patients who are sick tend to get more fluid no matter what. But this was a clinical trial. So a clinical trial should not have uh, much of that problem. 
and, and it clearly demonstrated uh, improved outcomes with a conservative fluid strategy. So what I do is, I always try to keep, I don't typically follow the CVP, uh, I don't believe uh, in following the CVP, but what I basically try to do in my patients with AIDS is to keep the fluid balance even to mildly negative, so that by the end of seven days we're here, not here, okay? What about neuromuscular blocker? So, uh, neuromuscular blocker may improve ventilation uh, patient sy synchrony. It allows for adjustment of uh, tidal volume and, and, and pressure levels, and, and it limits the risk of uh, bottle trauma and overdistension related to asynchrony. So, this was uh, a, a clinical trial, multi-center, double-blind trial, uh, that evaluated the use of cisatracurium uh, in patients with RDS. So the inclusion criteria is the patient had to be ventilated for less than 48 hours, the PL2 FL2 was less than 150, people of at least 5 and tidal volume of 6 to 8 uh, cc per kilo of ideal bottom weight, they had to have bilateral infiltrates on the chest x-ray, no evidence of heart failure, and the dose actually, it's interesting, you go over the study and you see that what they did is slightly different from what I do, but they did not titrate the cisatracurium. They actually kept a, a, a constant dose of 37.5 milligrams per hour. And they did that for only 48 hours, by the way. The control group got placebo, and the primary outcome was 90-day mortality. So uh, they enrolled 340 patients, and they found uh, an improvement in mortality. Actually, the mortality was 31.6% in the cisatracurium group versus 40.7% in the placebo group. So, uh, quite remarkable as well. So, what is the main safety concern of neuromuscular blocker? It's actually muscle weakness. Uh, it's more common steroid, ster steroidal compounds such as vecoronium, ve ve pancoronium, rocoronium, but it can also occur in cisatracurium. Uh, in that particular trial, actually there's no significant increase in weakness of neuromuscular blocker, but we know that it can occur in cisatracurium. So I created this algorithm that summarizes the uh, therapeutic options and the management of ARDS. So you have someone with ARDS who requires invasive mechanical ventilation. You're going to start the patient low tidal volume, 60 cc per kilo of ideal body weight. You're going to titrate the PEEP according to the FIL2. If the PO2 FIL2 is over 200, you're going to use the low PEEP FIL2 table. If the PO2 FIL2 is less, equal less than 200, you're going to use the high PEEP FIL2 table. You're going to limit the tidal volume to, so that the plateau pressure is below 30. So if the plateau pressure is above 30, you can go further down the tidal volume. You're going to use a conservative fluid approach. Unless the patient is very early on, still in, in shock and just came up from the emergency room and, and you are fluid resuscitated. But in general, you're going to use a fluid conservative, a conservative fluid approach. If the PO2 FL2 is less than 150 and the PEEP is at least 5, you're going to consider, strongly consider neuromuscular blocker, particularly if the patient is showing signs of asynchrony on the ventilator. Just don't forget to sedate the patient well when you put the patient on neuromuscular blocker. If after 12 to 48 hours the PO2 FL2 is still less than 150, and the FL2 is at least 0.6, and the PEEP is at least 5, and you haven't been, patient has not been on the ventilator for more than 36 hours, you're going to pronate this patient for at least 16 consecutive hours. If after that, your PO2 is less than 55, and you have a FL2 more than 0.6, and your plateau pressure is more than 35, or the pH is less than 7.15, you're in trouble. Call the fellow. But also, you can, if particularly if the patient, you can put a esophageal balloon, if you have that available, and, and see if the transponer pressure is still less, the transponer pressure in the end of expiration is still less than 25, in which case you can go up in the PEEP to see if you improve the oxygenation, 
or if the patient is obese or edematous, you can allow a higher plateau pressure if you suspect that the, the pleural pressure is going to be high, someone who is very edematous or someone who is morbidly obese, you can allow a higher plateau pressure, maybe up to 45, depending on the body size. Uh, or you can refer this patient to ECMO, and particularly you're going to do that for sure if you're having a problem with ventilation. So, just to conclude, uh, we re reviewed the ARDS definition, we took a look at the new definition, uh, there's no more acute lung injury, so you're still going to find that in the old literature. We looked at risk factors for ARDS. We talked about ARDS being, to some extent, a, 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 something that you can prevent in the hospital uh, by avoiding unnecessary blood transfusion, by ventilating everybody with low tidal volume, no matter what, no matter if they have ARDS or not, by uh, choosing the appropriate antimicrobials, by trying to avoid, to the extent that is possible, aspiration, we talked about the ventilation strategy for ARDS and the main thing is low tidal volume and use of PEEP. We talked about prone position. This is something that we have been doing here at the University of Louisville. Uh, we have been doing uh, with certain frequency. We talked about ECMO and we talked about the criteria for ECMO and ECMO is available at Jewish. If you have someone who you are not able to ventilate or if you have someone who you are not able to oxygenate despite high PEEP, despite a high plateau pressure, despite maybe prone position, uh, you can call the uh, cardiac surgery at, at, uh, service at Jewish. They'll come here and they'll actually uh, pick up the patient. Sometimes they'll initiate ECMO while here. And they do that in all hospitals in the city. We talked about fluid management and, and, and we talked about uh, uh, conservative fluid management being important in patients with ARDS. And we talked about neuromuscular blocker. Thank you.